Love is the desire to see unnecessary suffering ameliorated. Love is a very difficult word to use because in some sense it's be mouthed to, to, to death. You know, it's such a commonplace. And if you're attempting to affect virtue, then the first thing you do is speak about love. And it's very difficult to, to speak about love without feeling, I would say, self-contempt, really, because it is a word that's misused so badly. But I'd like to offer a technical definition of it and, and then put it into relationship, into proper relationship with what I already discussed. If, if hatred is the desire to see being eliminated because of its catastrophe, then love is the desire to see being elevated, maybe even because of that suffering, and to say that the proper orientation in life is to work diligently for the alleviation of unnecessary suffering and to make that the core element of your being, your, your actual aim, because you need an aim. Everyone needs an aim. We're, 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 we're creatures who are evolved to aim. We're hunters for that matter, and we need a target to aim at. We're not ever oriented properly without an aim. And then you might say, well, why not choose a name that is everything that you could possibly want it to be? And, and I would say that that is what you want to do, because first of all, being miserable and vulnerable and subject to catastrophe and decay, it's easy to see, sink into self-contempt and, and misery, self-conscious misery. And I think the only way out of that is to voluntarily shoulder a burden that the shouldering of grants you some respect for your own existence. And so then you think, well, the way forward confidently is to find the biggest load that you can possibly lift and then lift it and then walk forward with it because then you can see that there's something to you uh, that transcends your vulnerability and and ennobles the world and and works against the very terrible problems of both suffering and malevolence that might drive you to despair to begin with and so when i'm working with my clinical clients and I think when I'm speaking to people in general when I'm properly oriented this is the development of thought that was originally laid down in part by Carl Rogers although he was deeply influenced by by his Christian background uh, he's a very famous psych psychologist and he said that the way to treat people in therapy is with unconditional positive regard and and I would say that that's a noble formulation, but it's erroneous because that isn't exactly, in my estimation, what you should do with people. And I don't think it's what I do with people. What I do with people is to try to find the part of them that is striving towards the light and that would like being itself to be elevated and ennobled and suffering ameliorated, especially the unnecessary suffering, and then form an alliance with that and communicate with that and encourage that, which is what I think you do to people that you love. And you can't do that if there's bitterness in your heart because that's actually the part that you want to destroy if, if you're bitter. As the story of Cain and Abel tells us in, 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 a in a terribly brief period of time with terrible power, you replace contempt for being and resentment and hatred for being with, with love and that's the desire to see the good flourish in you and in others and I don't mean the good in that smarmy and contemptible manner that it's often presented. I mean the good as the culmination of brilliant awareness and, and courage and strength that it really is. And that you would wish to bring forward in everyone, to encourage in everyone if you were oriented properly in the world. And to seek that kind of orientation is to ground yourself in love instead of Mephistophelian hatred and and you have nothing better to do than that and you might as well do the best that you have to do because what do you have to lose? You're going to lose everything anyways. So in the process of preparing to lose everything you might as well risk everything you have doing the best thing that you can possibly conceive of. And there's no loss in that for you. There's nothing but gain. And 
There's nothing for, but gain for everyone around you if you do that, and so why would you not do that? Except for bitterness and resentment and perhaps a, lot, a, lot, a lack of confidence. Perhaps because you haven't been encouraged properly, and that's too bad because that's a lot different than being empowered, by the way, to be encouraged. It's a much better word. So then I wrote that truth is the handmaiden of love. And what I meant by that, because I've always wondered, knowing that truth and love are perhaps the cardinal virtues, what is the proper way of conceptualizing the relationship. And it seems to me that truth has to be oriented towards something. It needs a context. There's no such thing as, not, not in the way that I'm thinking of truth, there's no such thing as context-free truth, not, not in the moral domain, not in the domain of action. And that's the, I'm talking about truth in action. Truth is the handmaiden of love, I suppose, because having oriented yourself to the highest good that you can conceive of, like Geppetto wishing on the star in Pinocchio, then you speak truth with that orientation in mind, having the faith, I suppose, that because being is good, articulating its nature as clearly as possible is the best way of continuing to encourage that good to spring forward. Otherwise, you're presuming, if you use deceit and falsehood, that being is essentially corrupt, because otherwise you wouldn't have to falsify it in order to operate in the world. So you could say, well, you could make the courageous assumption that being is good, despite, I suppose, some evidence to the contrary, and then take the great risk of speaking truth in relationship to that, under the assumption that whatever speaking truth produces, if it's oriented properly, is good. You have to make decisions like that in your life. I mean, I can give you a, a simple example, I suppose. A while back, I was speaking at McMaster University, and there were a lot of protesters there, and that made me nervous because you never know when someone is going to do something unforgivably stupid, and so far, I've been fortunate that in the controversies that I've been embroiled in, that no one has done that. They've pushed the edges of that, but, but they haven't done it, and, and truly, thank God for that. But having said that, I wasn't upset by the presence of the protesters because I couldn't tell if the fact they were there was a good thing or a bad thing. It could be a good thing, it could be a bad thing. It was a consequence of what I had been speaking of and that's what happened. And so I thought there was no reason not to let that play itself out because the end of the story had not yet been reached and the meaning of the events could not yet be specified. And, you know, sometimes in your family, if you tell someone the truth, and I don't mean, and I hope I've coined this, I don't mean black truths. You know, there's white lies, and a white lie occurs when, to preserve a higher moral virtue, you, you contaminate a lower moral virtue. You know, perhaps you don't tell a child dying of cancer that they're going to die. I don't know, because it depends very much on the particulars of the situation. But, you can understand that you would have mixed motives in a situation like that. You can also speak black truths, and a black truth is when you say something that's nominally true, but you're using it as a weapon for another purpose. And that's not a truth. That's, that's really a more, a more profound and evil lie than any other one that you could possibly manage, because you're using the truth in a way that corrupts it, corrupts the truth itself, and that's really reprehensible. But barring the use of the black truth, you know, if within your family you say what you mean, you say what you think, that can often cause tremendous upheaval because, well, because many relationships are cobbled together by various alliances of willful blindness and things left unspoken, and that's a very bad long-term strategy. 
you know, I've seen people who are embroiled in the death throes of a relationship that perhaps accrued a hundred thousand lies over its course and became so unstable because of that that there was no hope for it. And each of those lies was a forestalled opportunity to address something difficult with truth that was foregone. And all that does is make those unsolved problems accumulate and multiply and they eventually take form and attack and generally when you're least expected. And so if you speak the truth in your family, cautiously and carefully, and knowing that you could be wrong, you will cause a people in conflict, but it's conceivable that that's the least amount of upheaval and conflict that could exist to make things right. And I believe that that is the case and that one of the things that I tell people who are too agreeable, let's say, and who don't like to cause conflict, and I actually don't like to cause conflict because I'm more agreeable than I should be, um, is that the the ethical requirement to tell the truth trumps any desire to avoid conflict. And it's partly because you only forestall the conflict and magnify it. There's no escaping it. And it's better to engage in it directly when it first, when the necessity first arises than to forestall it. And so for people who are only too willing to make peace at the expense of themselves, let's say, I try to encourage them to generate conflict by telling the truth. And I would say inevitably that has nothing but beneficial medium to long-term consequences in their life, even though it exposes them to more conflict in the short term. It also alleviates their resentment because if someone has made you resentful, or if you've become resentful because of someone's actions, then there's only two real reasons why. And one is that you should pull up your socks and quit complaining and quit whining because you're be being required to shoulder a responsibility or you're being oppressed and tyrannized by someone who doesn't know where their proper limits are. And in the former case, then you should get your act together, and in the latter case, you should stand up and stop that person from encroaching upon you. So you speak truth in your family, let's say, and perhaps even to yourself, at the risk of, of conflict, and often severe conflict, but the ultimate goal is to bring peace. And it's paradoxical because we often don't think of peace as something that's reached through conflict, but that is precisely, for example, why we value free speech, because the wisdom of humanity and, and the wisest people that we know, and that would include those people who were intelligent enough to found this country on the principles that it is founded on, knew that whatever conflict free speech might produce pale in comparison to the conflict that was generated by tyranny and repression of the exchange of opinion. And so it's never a matter of picking a safe path because there's no such thing as a safe path. It's only a matter of picking the path that produces the least catastrophe possible. And it's an, in, it's an inviolable principle, I would say, and also the fundamental principle of Western civilization that speech freely exchanged is the best pathway to peace and redemption that we have identified. And so it should remain untrammeled under all circumstances possible, subject to very infrequent restraints of the sort that are already encapsulated in law, such that, for example, you cannot incite someone to a criminal activity.